I can assure you from personal experiences and people that I see in practice of awareness is that the questions do come. It's just a matter of listening. And the more silent you are, the more you will be able to listen. I'm Razzie Berry, and this is Love is Medicine. At Love is Medicine, we explore the convergence of love and health. As we investigate the art and science of love, we discover how our relationships with each other and the world around us mediate and mitigate our biology, psychology, physiology, and consciousness. I welcome you on this journey to self-healing because love is medicine. Hi, welcome back to Love is Medicine. I'm Razzie Berry. Yes, that is my real name. Sometimes I get asked that question and I forget that it is such an unusual name, but it is my birth name. And I'm really loving this journey with all of you where we are exploring the ways that we connect with each other, with ourselves and the world around us the way that affects our health, our physical health, our emotional health. And in moving through the world in loving ways, in in speaking your truth with love, in treating your body with love, that is the deepest medicine. So today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Palacios, a naturopathic physician specializing in craniosacral and botanical medicine, diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, the ways that our body tells us that it wants our attention. But what I like about his work is he works to balance the person's body, mind, and vitality. And so I've been following Dr. Palacios for a while now. He's got a lot of wisdom that comes from his studying of ancient healing, the way the ancients went about healing. And we're going to talk about that today and about self-awareness and how that has shifted in our modern society, how we've shifted away from following the seasons. And I think today is going to be a real treat for all of us on our journey to wholeness. Thanks for being here today. Sure. Thank you for having me over. It's an honor to be here too. I get a little nugget of wisdom with everything that you write everything that you post. And so I knew that I wanted to get to know you in a deeper way and get inside that heart and head of yours. Because it's such a it's so wonderful to really blend this ancient wisdom, these ancient traditions with modern medicine. How did that become important to you? Became very important and This happened ever since I found that naturopathic medicine exists. Ever since graduating from undergrad about, I would say about seven years ago, I was looking for a form of medicine to study. But I realized and I learned that the conventional way was not something that I could be attuned with. But once I found naturopathic medicine, it just like fell into place so much because we learn a lot about the wisdoms of the ancients and our mentors, our teachers, our professors, they lived the medicine and a lot of their wisdom comes from many generations before modern medicine became, you know, what we call the new guide on the street. So it's always something that attracted me and and I, I felt like I needed to bring some of that ancient wisdom back to today because I feel like we need it. We need it back a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that, and I'm going to learn this from you, but I feel like the ancients were more connected, of course, to nature. Because of that, they were more connected to themselves. Correct, right. There was a big communication between the environment, the outside environment, and the person within. That disconnection leads to, I guess one of the things it leads to is a lack of self-awareness, which we're going to talk about today. Maybe we could start there. What do you see self-awareness to be? This little word I like to use in replace to meditation 
because I have realized through learning and practicing different types of meditations throughout my years is that there is actually two types of meditations that we learn. There is the Western type of meditation where if you actually go and look in the dictionary of anything available like Merriam-Webster, you will notice that the definition of meditation means a type of concentration, a type of attentive focus. Like, for example, you are sitting down, you're closing your eyes, and you're focusing on, say, um, a color or love and kindness. So that's a type of meditation. And that is what the West has gotten from the Eastern wisdom of yoga as once East and West became more integrated. But I also wanted to mention that there is another type of meditation that isn't exactly defined in the Western terms because it's something more of an experience. And this is more of the self-awareness aspect that I believe seems to be more experiential. So in this case, the type of meditation that I mean in the Eastern sense, the definition is not a focused attention. The definition is something more of a a state of being, a state of lifestyle, a state of silence that's deeply rooted within. And if we go back, the word Zen, the actual term in Chinese characters, the Zen word means alone and self-awareness, so self-growth. So a, that's the type of a self-awareness that I actually trying to advocate in this case. So it's it's more on the meditation based on what the Easterns like, practiced. It wasn't something much to intellectualize because you cannot intellectualize states of beings. You know, you have to be what you show. You have to be the message and then others will understand it without a single word. I knew that I liked you. <laughs> Because I don't really love the kind of meditation that's just a closed eyes, sitting cross-legged, back straight, going in just inside your body and trying to, you know, clear your mind. Like, I just don't, that's not where it's at for me. And even in the book I'm writing, I teach a kind of meditation that's kind of like an anti-meditation where you just, yeah, you take a moment in your time and you just fully experience it with all of your, with all of your senses. So like right now sitting in this chair, it's like, I'm, I've been sitting cross-legged. So my foot was starting to fall asleep and I've got my cell phone turned off on buzz, but I can feel it go off every once in a while. And, and I see birds flying around the lemon tree outside my window. And I'm just kind of aware of all these things and what my heart rate's like. And what the taste in my mouth is. And it might be different from what you're saying, but that's kind of, to me, what meditation is. I take these little breaks and try to become fully aware of exactly where I'm at in the world and in relation to other people. And it helps me with my intuition, to be quite frank. Yes, yes. And that's that's exactly what I mean by this type of self-awareness. Literally just me, be aware of the self. Mm-hmm. So yes, what those practices are exactly what this type of meditation that I'm advocating. Because, you know, a lot of people tend to um, resist to the, the modern types of meditation because in a certain way, it is a type of indoctrination that you're doing. You know, if you're not sitting, it means you're not meditating. It ends up becoming a cycle of indoctrination later on, you know? Yeah, or having to breathe a specific way. Exactly. That, that's like the complete opposite of self-awareness because we're trying to create, we're trying to force a habit into our beings and our beings just cannot do that. They will resist. We also, I think, have lost a lot of self-awareness just because of our modern lifestyle practices. And I'm not against them necessarily. Like we're able to communicate from far away and it's very meaningful, but yet we're constantly looking at different electronic devices for the answers to everything that we want or need or desire. 
whether it's how to fix a relationship, how to lose weight, how to sleep better, how to get out of pain. And we're constantly like searching outside of us. Right. Yeah. And it is, that is a, a true statement of how self-awareness in our modern society is becoming more disconnected because, you know, we seek answers. We all of us have questions regardless of what it is and regardless of the state, you know, the age that we're in. We have different journeys. We have different questions. We want different answers. But it, when we are overloaded with so much information and that's what we internet is today nowadays. It's just a lot of information. We become so saturated that we have no idea what to think anymore. And it just ends up being more harmful than helpful sometimes to have so much, too many answers to one single question. <laughs> well, that's my experience when I try to seek answers outside more and more and more. It just becomes saturation, saturation overload in my head. And but if you, I mean, this is something that, you know, I cannot obviously promise, but I, I can assure you from personal experiences and people that I've seen practice of awareness is that the questions do come. It's just a matter of listening. And the more silent you are, the more you will be able to listen. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that we can become more self-aware? What are some ways that we can feel more confident to listen within? Yeah, so this is where, you know, part of the, what I like to talk about comes into the place, the aspect of the seasons, because if we keep track, and it's at least, I believe we're still very in tune with the seasons in comparison to everywhere else, because if you go outside, you'll know that it's hot. If you don't go outside, you'll know that it's cold. That's not something you can just simulate. If you, unless you live in a building or underground for many years and you know, you've never seen the outside world, but I don't think that's the case for most of us. <laughs> However, if the seasons is something that we can start developing more of this self-awareness, understanding that where we are, understanding like, how our bodies respond to the different climates, to the different temperatures, to the different weather changes. And that's just being self-aware of that, we can actually understand where some of our problems come in, like our health challenges can come in from that. I say this a lot, but we've got so much technology. We can scan every part of our body. We can test for genes, we can test for microbes, we can test for pretty much anything. And yet the world is seeing more disease. Yes, yes, it is an unfortunate reality that you know we have to accept. Yeah, there's the lifestyles of today is causing a lot of well, when it comes to foods, it's very it's very calorie dense foods, but not nutritionally dense. And that's already a problem in itself. And then we also have the, the lifestyles that we are expected to live. You know, follow the steps of your parents, grandparents, follow the steps or follow the expectations of what your, your elders want you to do. And, and when you realize that's not something you preferably want to do, it becomes a conflict. And, you know, there's a lot of internal conflict and internal suffering going on. And, and unfortunately, technology has also separated us from human connection because now we can just go online and quickly like or dislike on the internet. But the human interaction is it's being more and more missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how how are we going to possibly live with the seasons when we are separated from the earth all day long, when we're in these shelters where we don't really follow the cycles of light and dark, when we don't experience change of temperature, when we don't follow the cycles of the moon? How are we going to get back to it? This is you know, a little bit of what I want to share of what the seasons mean from 
Well, the major viewpoints that I was able to understand is what, you know, the practices of the, de- of the seasons and how to go about them is to actually understand what each season means. And in this specific topic, I'm just mentioning about the four major seasons, which is spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And obviously, as if you live in other parts of the world, the seasons do change. If you truly live more of the equator, the tropical regions, you're going to have more of a rainy season, but not necessarily winter with snow per se. But I believe in most of America, we can conclude that, you know, the four major seasons is something that affects us. So I can definitely give some or shine some new knowledge into how we can start practicing into, you know, just making, start making small changes and small practices according to the seasons. and. The thing is, is that one does see, one does see results. One does start feeling a little bit more connected, a little bit more happy by trying to do this little practices in the seasons. Yeah, let's get into some of those practices because I have a few that I do with my daughters. But like, I'm good at connecting with nature, but I'm not always good at really honoring the seasons because I live in Phoenix where we don't have a lot of seasons. So I'm always wanting to learn more. And I love the way you follow the moon as well. So I would, let's talk about some of those practices to get back in sync with the cycles of nature. Of course. Yeah. So a few of the things that I want to just mention is that in the major seasons, there's the ancients. I just want to say that in this, what I've learned is comes from two traditions. One is called the Greek or the Unani tradition, and this comes from like the time of Hippocrates when he started to. Hippocrates is the father of medicine, or at least Western medicine, and he is actually somebody who composed what is it to like to be a good doctor, what is it like to be a good doctor, what is it like to have the right diagnostic tools and how is it like to treat. Uh, he was actually one of the first people to compose a text on how to record the practices of medicine. So in his teachings, he taught about the, the four human, uh, sorry, the four humors. And each humor was derived from what today are called as the classical elements of fire, water, air, and earth. And he made a connection between the seasons and before those four humors. And even today, I mean, that, that philosophy was followed by the Arabs when the Crusades were going on back in the 1200s. The Arabs took, actually got their best practices of medicine based on Hippocrates' writings and following that. And that's where Unani medicine comes in. But just to make it as simple as possible is the correlations between those four elements and the four seasons. So, and I think it's very self-explanatory when you notice the correlates. So in, in Greek medicine, they have the summer and the summer is correlated with fire. I think that makes sense because, you know, it's very hot. It's a time of dry and heat. Then they have spring, which is, tends to be more of the earth. And that actually helps because the, the springtime, roughly, in the spring is where the, the pre-harvest season comes in. That's where people start planting and putting seeds throughout the summer and the fall. You know, they can have their crops finished by that time. So yeah, the spring will be more of the pre-harvest season correlated with the earth element. Fertility. Yes, also fertility, which is the time of Easter. The other one was summer being heat and then autumn being more. Now we're getting more into the cooling, the the chilly aspect. In this case, it will be known as air or wet in this case because the fall was like a mix between late summer 
and early fall. So late summer is usually considered to be a rainy season, a rainy where there is a lot of rain and then it just evaporates and then there's a lot of thunderstorms. That's something that we see a lot in, at least in the Northeast where I am from. I'm not sure about areas in Phoenix, if there is a lot of rain there. There is, we have the monsoon season coming. You know, the monsoon season will be, you know, it rains a lot, there's a lot of overflow and that's where, you know, the crops can be, they could be damaged if one is not careful or prepared to receive those. And then eventually comes winter, which is more of the coolest part. And that's com- compared to the water element. And the water element is all about keeping things inside, uh, the emotions, hibernating, staying home because it's too cold to go outside. So one is one of the things that has that one has to be careful is, is go outside for extended periods of times or people tend to be, be hungrier because, you know, that's a compensation of heat because when one eats, one makes more ATP or more energy and, what, and you know, the body becomes warm. So winter is the time when one tends to overeat and, and I've seen that in my, in my past when I didn't control my weight that I, during the winter, I gained a few couple pounds and then during the summer, I was able to reduce it back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that even in our traditions and holidays, right? Like we really feast throughout the winter. And then in like holidays like spring and stuff, there's more fasting that happens. Yes. And that's actually where the, the other practice that I kind of integrated together with some, you know, how to have proper seasonal behaviors. This one comes from Tibetan medicine. And, you know, without going too much into detail, Tibetan medicine is like a mix between Indian or Ayurveda and Chinese medicine. And then Tibetan medicine just combined the two together and made from their Buddhist religion, because in Tibet, Buddhism is the major, it's the the religion. So they had a mix of everything and they mixed a little bit of the both. So in Tibetan medicine, they actually speak a lot about, you know, the humors or the doshas like kapha, pitta, and vata from Ayurveda. Based on that, they're also able to make some, you know, they speak a lot about the seasons, how these interactions happen. And just to make it as simple as possible, so in the spring, just kind of how we talked about the fertility season, the season of pre-harvesting. Another thing that the Tibetans were mentioning is that because you ate so much during winter and during the spring now, this, this congestion, this fat that you consume during the winter starts to surface. So one is going to have more congestion during the springtime. One is going to end up having more allergies because their channels or the simple word for channel, in their words, meant just the orifices, the openings, the, the arteries, the veins. They start plugging a little more because they're trying to expel all of that mucus that one collected during the, the winter. So a good practice for that would be go to sweat lodges, have more frequent saunas. I believe it's called the, the neti pot, the nasal wash, where one puts a little teacup with a solution, a saline solution, and then helps decongest the sinuses. And all of those practices are actually going to help a lot for people with allergies because it's, you know, spring season is a big season for allergies. And that's something every naturopath can assure you. You kind of confirmed something that I've always intuitively felt. And so I always believed that the reason... (laughs) that there's an actual design behind our springtime allergies. And I really believe that these pollens and some spring vegetables like spring onions and, and such are around is because it helps our bodies emunction or kind of like helps us, you know, the sneezing and coughing and 
phlegm, these are ways that our body sort of expels, excretes, kind of cleans itself out. So I've always believed that there's a reason why we have these quote unquote seasonal allergens. I believe that it's our body's effort to, it's kind of like self-cleaning. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So yeah. And you think about it, it's like the Tibetans always say, if you are having a condition now in this season, think about what you did in the previous season. Think about what you did wrong or what you did too much of, because that's probably a manifestation, an immediate manifestation of what's happening at this point. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I really think so. And I, you know, observational reading, studying cases of people having similar experiences, it's, you know, everything starts making more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nature is so wise. Our bodies are so wise. How did the ancients really see healing different than the way we see it now? You can think of, like, like you know, let's go back in time where, say, 2,000 years ago, where the ancients, you know, you lived in a house probably made of... Mud or stone. Probably mud, yep, not too fancy. And you basically, during the day, you just had to go out, find water, find food. Uh, hopefully, if you lived in the city, you will be able to, you know, you will have a job. But then, you know, all the money that you made from the job is just to feed your family. And the weather was something that we just couldn't have much control of because the technology was so limited, at least when it comes to protection of weather. But a doctor at that time, they didn't have the tools that we have nowadays, you know, like the blood pressure cuff, the stethoscope, our x-ray machines, MRIs, you know, all of these sophisticated tools to diagnose and explore the inside of the body. They had to find other ways, so they had to improvise. And if we learn back in, like from modern traditions, at least in Chinese medicine or even Ayurvedic medicine, and even Tibetan medicine, we know that they had tools. And those are tools, for example, the pulse. That's something that many doctors like master. And a good doctor had to learn to take the pulse. Another thing was just general observations. And that's something that every good doctor knows. You know, he looks at the patient and he sees where he's sitting, and, you know check the eyes, check the face, check the, the fat distribution. And even, you know, today doctors have learned that from the past. Other things that are not something that you don't, you wouldn't think about much is actually behaviors from cattle. So for example, a good farmer knows when their cattle is sick. Like if their boats are sick, they have a different complexion. Their eyes don't look as bright. Also, pigs, pigs, for example, they would, whenever they ate something and something didn't fit right into their stomach, they would just cover themselves in mud. And that's a practice that ancient doctors will do, covering mud whenever you had an infection or like gastroenteritis, you know, which means a bug in your stomach, which will help. The mud will actually help to cool down the inflammation and, you know, kind of balance the immunity. And... Oh, and another thing that the Tibetans like to use a lot was urine, to diagnose based on your urine, based on the shape, not the shape, but the, the quality, the, the color, the smell. I don't think they did taste. I don't think they went that far. <laughs> but they did everything counted, you know, every body secretion counted. You know, parents might really be able to understand what you're saying because when you're a parent of a small child or an infant, it's like these are the things we notice. We notice like if there's something different in the color of their skin or the color of their eyes or if they smell differently or we're changing a diaper, if that smells differently, if they're moving their body in a different way. It's like intuitively as parents, at least as mothers, we understand those signs, but we've kind of unlearned that like modern medicine has deemed that unscientific and so a lot of doctors aren't learning how to read the pulses because there's different pulses right they're not learning how to read the eyes 
or the coating of the tongue, which can be so telling. Many doctors aren't even taught to palpate anymore, to touch, you know, feel the abdomen, to feel bones and joints. And it's really sad because there's just a machine can only tell us so much. Yes, it's, it's true. And even I noticed in parts of, I believe it was in Korea and some parts of Russia, where they have a robotic doctor. Basically, like you go, you just write your symptoms, and then this screen just gives you a diagnosis. And based on that, that's the medicine you're going to take for so many days. All an algorithm, but no intuition. There's no, no... Exactly, no human contact. How can healing happen, you know, when you're only being seen as an object and not as a person? So much of healing, you know, I believe as you do that healing comes from within, but the role of the doctor or the healer is many fold. It's to teach. It's also to give confidence to the patient. I mean... The power of placebo and nocebo is well documented. For those who haven't heard us talk about this before, you know, placebo is basically the belief in a positive outcome. This is a really basic general explanation. Nocebo is like the negative belief or the belief in a negative outcome. So, you know, you've heard cases when a doctor says, oh, you have X many weeks to live and the person dies exactly at that time because a lot of our internal environment is mediated by what we believe. Exactly. Yes, yes, you're right. And, and in the medical ethics, even in the ancient times, because a lot of doctors, they, some of them studied very extensively human behavior, and they will be able to predict like when a person will die. But in, the, in their ethics, from their teachers and their generations, one of the big, big no-nos was never tell your patient that they're going to die or never tell the family that you can tell them that there's danger, but you never tell them. You never predict the time of death because that's, that's a big mistake to do because you're, you're, giving, you're not giving the patient any hope and the patient is going ha- to have a lot of suffering from that. Mm-hmm. I have a whole podcast episode I did on hope. So if you're listening today, I would love for you to go back and listen to that one too, because hope is really powerful medicine. Yes. We started off talking about self-awareness moving into the seasons. And that's kind of about what we've gone into now is kind of about an awareness of how we are part of the greater world around us because it all affects each other. How do you encourage people to you know, reconnect? I think the first step that I try to do is to make them understand that, you know, their phone or their device, technological device that they keep, you know, to be put away at least for a couple hours a day. And I have noticed that is very, very difficult, especially today, very difficult. I think that's the first step, just putting your uh, technological device on your side and really just go out for a walk. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be in nature. One can reconnect even in the city. But, you know, but if you're not, you're not being stimulated by your thought patterns of, okay, I have to be there, I have to go there, it's going to create a lot of internal conflicts. And part of that practice that I also teach is breathe, remember yourself, practice the self-awareness techniques whenever you're feeling more the chaos is coming back because it does happen, you know, kind of like an addiction happens when, and, you know, a lot of people are very resistant to this, but coffee is a type of drug and, well, it is a drug. And many people are actually very addicted to coffee, more than sugar sometimes. But they say at coffee withdrawal, they have a lot of physical symptoms. And it's actually very similar to people who have like a cell phone withdrawal or a external technological withdrawal they don't necessarily get symptoms but they get like a lot of mental stimulation of like where they should be where they should be going or what they should be doing or what photos to post and part of this self-awareness practices is to breathe understand and remind yourself that 
you know, it should pass. And like in, in the Zen teachings, they say, if you are at peace, that they will come in and they will pass. But if you're in turmoil, just wait and it will pass also. So it's like, it's a cycle that you have to accept, but eventually you earn that you end up learning about yourself a lot more because self-awareness eventually is all about growing yourself more, growing yourself into, you know, growing your own intuition so you can tap into more an inner knowledge, an inner self that it's always there, but we just keep getting distracted from. Yeah, you know, in one of your posts, so I really encourage everyone to follow you on Instagram. It's Shamind11, S H A M I N D 1 1 on Instagram. We'll have links. But one of the posts I just love so much, you speak about three approaches to truth. And one, you're talking about science. And you remind us that it was once called philosophy in the ancient times. Now we call it science because of it, have come to understand the connection between the micro and the macro, between health and disease between chaos and peace. But of course, with the more answers we find, the more questions we have, and that can be you know, very humbling. And at the end of the post, I encourage everyone to go there and read it. But at the end of it, it says that you polish the mind to plant a seed of compassion and do the right thing. This is really important to me. I believe that we've kind of become afraid of morality because we attach it to religions. But as humans, we inherently understand right and wrong. Everyone is born with an understanding of right and wrong. And then you ask, what is the right thing? And your answer is anything where you light a candle of happiness in yourself and others simultaneously. And I think that is so brilliant because it really helps us have a compass because we can fight for what brings us happiness, but that can sometimes hurt others. But we know we're choosing the truth or the right thing when you are lighting a candle of happiness in yourself and others simultaneously. And I think about this, Javier, I think about how nature beckons us with beauty, natural beauty to be outside. It's good for us to be connected with the earth and with plants and to entice us to do that. It seduces us with the beauty or the feeling good in the sunshine or the delicious taste of of healthy food. So to me, what that means, like what I got out of that post is that, you know, by doing good to yourself and the earth and each other, that you there's less of a struggle. Yes, yes, exactly. It's such an interesting search nowadays that we seek questions about how to be, say, more friendly with other people, how to be more moral, how to please other people. And, you know, we're going to get so many answers. You're going to have the psychological answer. You're going to have the spiritual answer. You're going to have the organized religion answer. And like I said, the more answers you have, the more confusing what it becomes. But one needs to realize is that if whatever just finds attunement or there's a, a connection with one, what feels inside, then that is the right answer. It doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter who said it. If it makes sense within, in the heart, then that is something on the right track. And the, the practice of self-awareness just means to be more silent. So the answer becomes even more and more clear where you don't have to be more and more confused of the, all the information that you're receiving. That's lovely. What does love as medicine mean to you? Love as medicine means everything because love is, it is the ultimate medicine. Love means to unconditionally accept and be okay with how things turn out. And even if, actually I'd like to mention a little story based on that little, a little phrase. So this is a story that goes back from the times of Sufism, which is a, a mystical sect of Islam, which means that these are Muslims, but they don't necessarily 
have the scholarly teachings of the Quran. Instead, they try to have more of the practice, more of the meditative uh, practices of the Quran, or at least in Islam. And one of the, the teachers, he, he had a group of disciples, and Sufism wasn't very accepted back in the time because it was not part of the society. You know, they were traveling, going from town to town, and every night, the teacher, he will just bow down and show gratitude to God or Allah. Just say, thank you for everything. Thank you for what you've given me today. So every night, he will show some gratitude and then go to sleep. But one time, there was a week where he and his disciples traveled to many, many towns. And they were being rejected. They were sometimes being spit on. They were not wanted in that region at all. They were denied food, sometimes water. And for days they were hungry, but still every day the master, the teacher will go and bow and say gratitude to God for giving them what he wanted. And eventually one of the disciples was really angry and he just blurted out and said, how can you be happy? How can you show gratitude to these difficult times? I, I mean, it's, this is illogical. This is, are you, are you mad? The teacher said, he just looked at him and said, I've never experienced hunger for three days ever. And this is the first time I actually experienced it. And I can tell you that it's not a pleasant condition, but at least I know what it feels like now. And I know when somebody else is suffering from that, I will understand when they tell me that. So that's why I am thankful to God. That's why I feel this way, because I never have experienced this before. This never happened. You know, that was it. That was, I believe that's what really is love as medicine. Just regardless of what happens, always be willing to have an open heart because that's what he had. He didn't have a, an open mind. He had an open heart to these events. Yeah, having an open heart is, is a lovely thing. And life finds a way to make sure we do it. <laughs> either, either it, it does, it yes. Easily or it breaks it open for us. <laughs> yes. When it breaks it, it's ouch, but you know what? It had to happen. <laughs> right, right. It's true. I really enjoyed this conversation. Share with everyone how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Sure, yeah. So, you know, if you mentioned Razi, you can follow me on Instagram in S H A M I N D 11. I also have a Facebook, if you can just place my name, Javier Palacios. You know, you can follow me on Facebook. Usually I tend to post more on Facebook, but lately I've been keeping up with the Instagram trend. And there's also a website that if you'd like to learn more about some of the work that I do, some of the files to read for, for free, if you'd like to learn more about how the season, self-awareness, and a little introduction of naturopathic medicine, you can find it in my website at Dr. Javier Palacios And that will show you a little bit of what I do and where I am. And if, and if you think there's something that you'd like to work together on, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. That's lovely. I'll make sure that the show notes have the link so you guys can jump right in there. We also love to hear your feedback. So wherever you're listening to this, whether it's iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, please leave your comments in the reviews. That does a couple of things. One, leaving reviews helps other people find the episodes. That's just kind of how it works. The more ratings and reviews, the more it kind of opens up the flow to allow other people. And it's really important because there are a lot of corporate backed podcasts that have like a lot of money. So when you find podcasts like these independent podcasts, please leave ratings and reviews. And we'd love to hear from you. And we'll see you next time at Love is Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us at Love is Medicine. I'm Razzie Berry, and I love exploring these themes with you. If you enjoy these topics, you can spread the love by subscribing on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Leave a comment or review. I read all of them. And until next time, remember, 
All healing is self-healing. 